have the pleasure now of introducing uh, Professor Yasi Nurani of the School of Middle Eastern and North African Studies, and he is moderating our panel this afternoon on multilingualism simulated. So, Yasi, let me hear this. Okay. Um, so, before uh, starting, I'd like to thank David and the other organizers for inviting me to participate in this uh, conference. Um, so in the interest of time, I'm not going to give the speakers the um, introductions that they deserve. Um, I'll just sort of say who they are in the title of the paper. So first off, we have um, Yasemin Yildiz, um, Assistant Professor of Germanic Languages and Literatures, University of Illinois. And the title of her talk is The Monolingual Paradigm and the Post-Monolingual Condition. Um, can you hear me? Yeah, all right. Well, let me begin by um, thanking the organizers for this, uh, putting together this amazing conference and for being wonderful hosts to all of us. And um, I think the conference itself is a kind of exercise in multilingualism in terms of the very different disciplinary vocabularies and languages being used here. And uh, I find it an amazing uh, learning experience to hear ideas uh, expressed that um, I have been uh, thinking about in terms of literary cultural studies um, in other disciplines from computational linguistics to uh, uh, second language acquisition and so on. And it's, it's, um, it's very exciting to be here and to be part of this. All right. Let me introduce you to an artistic simulation of multilingualism that I discuss in my book, Beyond the Mother Tongue, the Postmonolingual Condition. On September 29, 2002, the Sunday issue of the New York Times included a 68-page paid insert previewing a conceptual artwork called Word Search, a translinguistic sculpture conceived by German artist Karin Sander and sponsored by the Deutsche Bank, the world's biggest art collector, corporate art collector. In response to the sponsor's request to offer a global perspective in a metropolitan location, Sander's project set out to document as many of the languages spoken in New York City as possible. It did so by finding, native, uh, by finding one native speaker for each of 250 languages and asking each speaker to contribute one personally meaningful word in his or her mother tongue to a list. The list of unduplicated words was then translated into all the other languages. The resulting 62,500 words were arranged into columns resembling stock market tables and published as the actual translinguistic sculpture in another paid eight-page insert in the business section of the New York Times on October 4th, 2002. This commissioned artwork, Word Search, thus sought to render the novelty of globalized life at the turn of the millennium through attention to the proximate coexistence of many languages in the same space. In today's talk, I want to use this artwork in order to offer a critical framework for analyzing the promises and pitfalls of multilingual forms, a framework that brings monolingualism into the picture as well. For monolingualism and the notion of the mother tongue continued the way, um, to inflect the way subjects, communities, and modes of belonging are conceived to a much greater de degree than is generally recognized. What ultimately marks many linguistic constellations today, and we've heard many examples here to confirm this, is the tense coexistence of re-emergent multilingual practices on the one hand, and a still dominant monolingual framework tied to the nation on the other. It is productive, I believe, to make this coexistence explicitly the focus of our analyses. To understand the functioning of multilingualism today, it is necessary to take to heart what scholars working on languages have known for quite a while, namely that monolingualism and not multilingualism is the more recent historical innovation. Emerging only in the course of the 18th century at the confluence of radical, political, philosophical, and cultural changes in Europe, 
the notion of monolingualism rapidly displaced practices of living and writing in multiple languages. To pre-modern rulers, European rulers for instance, it had been of little concern whether their subjects spoke one or more languages. With the gendered and affectively charged kinship concept of the unique mother tongue at its center, however, a network of discourses established the idea that having one language was the natural norm and that multiple languages constituted a threat to the cohesion of individuals and, collect and societies. Even as they supported the study of other languages, late 18th century German thinkers such as Johann Gottfried Herder, Wilhelm von Humboldt and Friedrich Schleiermacher spearheaded the view that one could properly think, feel and express oneself only in one's mother tongue. This notion of the mother tongue has been in turn a vital element in the imagination and production of the homogenous nation state. Based on its provenance and function, monolingualism is thus much more than a simple descriptive term. It constitutes a key structuring principle that organizes the entire range of modern social life, from the construction of individuals and their proper subjectivities, to the formation of disciplines and institutions, and to imagine collectives such as cultures or nations. It is, in other words, a paradigm. According to this paradigm, individuals and social formations are imagined to possess one true language only, and through this possession to be organically linked to an exclusive, clearly demarcated ethnicity, culture, and nation. Yet from the beginning, this paradigm has confronted divergent linguistic practices and thus has always required an active process of monolingualization. On the one hand, this process has entailed the social engineering of monolingual populations, facilitated especially through educational policies. On the other hand, it has constantly minimized, pathologized, or simply disavowed existing multilingualisms, both in the present and the past. And I think the uh, talk about language pain and language shame that we heard uh, yesterday is an example of the effects of this process. Multilingualism then has not been absent in the last couple of centuries, but in many places it has been refracted through the multi monolingual paradigm. This persistence of a monolingual framework I propose is the backdrop against which we need to see today's seeming increase in multilingualism. To describe the tense coexistence of a still dominant monolingual frame framework tied to the nation state on the one hand and re-emergent multilingual practices on the other, I'd like to introduce the term post-monolingual. This post has, in the first place, a temporal dimension. It signifies the period since the emergence of monolingualism as a dominant paradigm. Such a historicized understanding is necessary because the appearance of the monolingual paradigm substantially changes the meaning and resonance of multilingual practices. It thereby begins to illuminate the radical difference between pre-monolingual forms of multilingualism and post-monolingual ones. In this uh, sense, post-monolingual refers to the unfolding of the effects of the monolingual and not to its successful overcoming or transcendence. But aside from this temporal dimension, the prefix post also has a critical function, where it refers to the opposition to the term that it qualifies and to a potential break with it, as in some notions of postmodernism. In this second sense, postmonolingual highlights the struggle against the monolingual paradigm. As Marianne Hirsch notes with regard to the post in her own term post memory, the prefix quote reflects an uneasy oscillation between continuity and rupture. Taking these two dimensions together, I use postmonolingual to identify a field of tension in which the monolingual paradigm continues to assert itself while multilingual practices persist or reemerge. It thus brings into sharper focus the back and forth movement between these ten two tendencies that I see as characteristic of contemporary linguistic constellations. Focusing on the tension rather than on one or the other pole helps to account for many uh, phenomena that initially appear to be contradictory, including the monolingual logic of a multilingual artwork that I will elucidate with my reading of word search today. If we think of monolingualism as a paradigm rather than as a quantitative term, 
it becomes clear that the mere multiplication of languages does not alter it. The number of languages is not an issue for the monolingual paradigm in the Herderian vein, as long as each language is conceived as distinct and separate and is belonging to just one equally distinct and separate people. What this position cannot abide is the notion of blurred boundaries, crossed loyalties, and unrooted languages. Such effects, however, can be achieved through the arrangement and configuration of languages, in other words, through form. To analyze instantiations of the postmonolingual condition, therefore, requires attention to the particular form that multilingualism takes, rather than to the number of languages present. Let me demonstrate such an analysis through the artwork word search, which I read as symptomatic of the postmonolingual rather than as critically engaging with it. Oh, that was too far. The first aspect that is striking about word search is the fact that the image of societal multilingualism in a global city that it seeks to render rests on a conception of the monolingualism of individuals. The magazine insert, which functions as a catalog to the final art piece, features numerous full-page color images of individuals who are photographed in the midst of their busy work day as they take a moment to write down their particular words on pieces of paper. Well, hopefully the next one will work. <laughs> um, okay. In these pictures, the catalog highlights the individuals constituting the multilingual global city as speakers of distinct mother tongues who are effectively associated with that language only. Although the magazine insert mentions the multilingual competencies of the pictured individuals, and this is the one that I was going to show right now. Oh, you can go to that next slide. Yeah. Um, such as uh, Julia speaks Tachiki. Uh, hold on. Sorry, I just lost my face because of the images. Mm. Although the magazine insert mentions the multilingual competencies of the pictured individuals, such as in the case of Julia, where it says Julia speaks Tachiki, Russian, and English, it identifies them solely with one language, their ostensible mother tongue. Julia is introduced under the heading Tachiki and is asked to contribute a word from this one language only. While the artwork renders the social space as marked by the presence of multiple disparate languages, it thus continues to cast the individual according to a monolingual model where all languages but the singular mother tongue are treated as secondary and irrelevant. The claim to the exclusivity of the mother tongue, however, rests on the continued disavowal of multilingualism. Like Julia, many of the participating individuals actually speak multiple languages, as the brief notes on the speakers in the catalog and the accompanying website reveal. Gambian immigrant Sana Kanute, who contributes a word in the West African language Soninke, for instance, also speaks nine languages, with Soninke just one of his mother tongues. By denying what it acknowledges on the margins, the artwork affects a form of disavowal. I know very well that these are speakers of multiple languages, but nevertheless, I will present them as possessing a single language. This I know very well, but nevertheless structure is, of course, the signature of fetishism. Fetishism, we recall, preserves the wholeness of the mother in order to disavow castration and lack. In the case of the monolingual paradigm, it is the mother tongue whose wholeness and exclusivity needs to be preserved. What is at stake in this staging of individuals as primarily monolingual, as defined by their mother tongue, when at the same time they are posited as the building blocks of a larger monolingual whole, multilingual whole? Throughout the catalog text, printed in both English and German, the predominantly German commentators equate language with culture. Zanda, for instance, states about the prospective reader of her, of her translinguistic sculpture, der Leser findet durch die Verwendung seiner Sprache seine eigene Herkunftskultur repräsentiert. Through the use of his language, the reader finds his own culture of origin represented. The reference to origin suggests that the term culture is in fact used in the anthropological sense of ethnicity. 
The prevalence of embassies and consulates as sources for native speakers for the project extends and further underscores the assumed homology between language, culture, ethnicity, and nationality that underwrites the project. The insistence on identifying the individual with one language only, namely the presumed mother tongue, then amounts to the insistence of the continued validity of a Hardarian conception of language, culture, and nation. The individual, in other words, becomes the site or the scale at which the Herderian conception can be preserved even in the face of globalization. To understand more fully the stakes behind re-establishing the distinctness of cultures and ethnicities, it is necessary to turn to another issue that word search raises but does not explicitly address. The project is the brainchild of a German artist who realizes it for a nominally German, but in fact transnational financial institution. To explore the coexistence of multiple languages, the artist turns to New York City rather than considering a German site, Frankfurt am Main, for instance. Frankfurt, the bank's headquarters and more generally the financial capital of uh, Germany, would have been a viable alternative as it is one of the country's most diverse multi-ethnic and multilingual cities. Instead, it serves only as a place of reception where the entire New York Times issue with the word search insert was printed by special arrangement and distributed to pedestrians on the same day. As so often since the 19th century, the United States, and New York in particular, serves as a site for German fantasies about cultural heterogeneity that are implicitly contrasted with an imagined German homogeneity. Word search displaces multilingualism outside Germany, into a space whose globalized and transnational nature is more readily recognized and acceptable than that of Germany. The displaced form uh, of the project's multilingualism offers a safe distance for savoring difference and internal heterogeneity without having to acknowledge it at home. And I think that uh, something similar may be going on when some Americans talk about Europe is so multilingual, we Americans are so monolingual, and in some ways even the lament of uh, you know, we're so monolingual, is a form of disavowal of the existing uh, multilingualism of this country. So it's exactly one of those moments of the instantiation of the monolingual paradigm by saying, oh, we're so monolingual, yet Europe is so multilingual. The other thing that I always find interesting in that context is that it's often Europe that's multilingual and not, say, Africa, or African countries, which are much, much more multilingual than Europe. So it's also an interesting pairing that goes on in those kinds of um, rhetorical moves. Okay, uh, back to word search. Ultimately, the assertion of the distinctness and separateness of cultures and ethnicities attempts to assuage often voiced German fears of being leveled by globalization. Rather than reconfiguring and altering languages, cultures, and ethnicities, the word search catalog presents globalization as preserving and accommodating them harmoniously. The configuration of languages in this artwork thus carefully manages difference by producing it along preserved homogeneous ethnocultural lines and by situating it outside Germany. <laughs> Multilingualism, in other words, does not simply constitute a straightforward expression of multiplicity, plurality, and difference, but rather a malleable form that can be put to different and contradictory uses. Word search itself demonstrates this possibility in its dual form. The catalog to word search, which I have been discussing so far, is after all only one side of this artwork. The final piece itself lays out an entirely different logic. In contrast to the emphasis on particularity, cultural origin and identity in the colorful catalog and its stress uh, on handwritten and thus authenticated words, you see that here, um, the final translinguistic sculpture itself celebrates abstraction, universality, and equivalency. The arrangements of words in stock market tables suggests that language is a commodity to, to be traded like any other, while translation becomes the means of producing equivalency and surplus value. As in a financial dream, the collected words begin to multiply. Through translation, the starting capital of 250 words generates a massive 62,500. This prol proliferation 
differs from heteroglossia by its very orderliness. While multilingual environments generally lead to co language contact and thus to new linguistic forms via borrowing, code switching, code mixing, the words in these stock market columns stay separate and untouched by each other. They too thus reproduce globalization as a process that preserves distinctness. In this case, the unchanged nature of the words obscures the, re the results of the global financial activity to which the arrangement of these words refers, namely the deep-seated transformations such financial activity causes, the destabilization it brings, and the uneven distribution of wealth to which it leads. Between the pictures of individuals in the catalog and the endless columns of words in the verbal sculpture, oh, and the other side, imagine the, a person signing, uh, uh, who's writing the word, it should have been there. Between this picture and these pictures, word search performs multilingualism as a fantasy of preserved particularities and individuality on the one hand, and as a fantasy of complete equivalency, anonymity, and unencumbered universality of the financial markets on the other. Given this perfect self-image of neoliberal globalization, it may be symptomatic that an art critic refers to word search as an artwork and exhibition by Zanda while a business news report calls it a Deutsche Bank integrated advertising campaign. Through its form, word search enacts the tension between re-emergent multilingualism and persistent monolingualism that characterizes the post-monolingual condition. But it does so in a way that recasts the monolingual paradigm for a new age in order to retain it. To conclude, even in the present form of word search, however, the word arrangement may provoke responses that go beyond the ones highlighted by the artist. Rather than primarily reading the words for the representation of one's own culture of origin, the modulation of words can incite pleasure in shapes and Im imagined sounds, a possibility briefly mentioned by the artist, but quickly subordinated to the privileged identificatory mode of reception. Yet unfamiliar words can also draw the viewer in. One could engage with these words in a manner modeled by the Japanese-German writer Yoko Tawada, who has developed an entire aesthetic around reading words multilingually and developing new stories on this basis. In one literary essay musing on Else Lasker Schüler's poem Mein blaues Klavier, my blue piano, for instance, she finds the words la vie in clavier, which she uses as a point of departure for her reflections on the poem. Rather than looking for the mother tongue, this Japanese expatriate writer, who writes in both Japanese and German, time and again uses multilingualism in order to question the mother tongue and the monolingualism of any language. Multilingual performances are most productive and promising when they help to change the conceptual frameworks through which we perceive languages and the arenas in which they circulate. At a time when multilingualism seems to be proliferating all around us, it may be useful to consider the possibility that some cultural productions do not avail themselves of multiple languages to such an end and instead reproduce limiting frameworks. A critical multilingualism, in contrast, could open what uh, the Italian, uh, um, um, I forget all the names, Amat Amati Mailer, Jacqueline Amati Mailer and some of her colleagues have called new affective paths through language, not tied to kinship and ethnic identity. In the process, it could contribute to a rethinking of the subject of institutional and social structures and of modes of belonging. The post-monolingual condition holds this promise, but without guarantees. Thank you.